Hello, and welcome to the Nutrition Diva podcast, a show where we take a closer look at nutrition news, research, and trends so that you can make more informed decisions about what you eat. I'm your host, Monica Reinagle. And in the past couple of weeks, two well-publicized studies are causing some concern about chemical exposure from foods that we would normally consider healthy. But I think the media coverage may have created a somewhat distorted impression. In both cases, the risks are being presented without important context that allows you to weigh the comparative risks and benefits. The first of these was a consumer report study on pesticide residues in commonly eaten produce. About 20% of the 59 different types of commonly eaten fruits and vegetables that they analyzed were found to pose a risk of exposure to potentially unsafe levels of pesticide residues. Organic produce generally showed significantly lower levels of pesticide residue. However, even some of the organic items were found to contain residues of pesticides that are not approved for organic farming. Imported produce in particular from Mexico, posed a higher risk compared to U.S.-grown produce. However, it should be noted that the Consumer Reports investigators set their own standards for safety, and as a result, exposure levels that the Environmental Protection Agency considers to be safe were categorized as risky. And furthermore, a vegetable was deemed to be a high risk, even if only a tiny proportion of the samples were found to have what Consumer Reports deemed to be unsafe levels. The other study that I want to talk about today was much more narrow, both in its scope and in its findings. Investigators were looking at levels of PFAs, popularly known as forever chemicals, PFAs in seafood that's available for purchase in the state of New Hampshire. Based on their samples and their analysis, the researchers concluded that Residents of the Granite State who eat shrimp and or lobster several times a week could potentially be exposed to concerning levels of PFAs. Now, on the one hand, I think both of these studies demonstrate the need for ongoing monitoring and action to ensure a safe food supply. And hey, heads up, if you live in New Hampshire— and you are cracking lobster claws Monday through Friday, week after week, you might want to mix it up a bit. But what do these findings really mean for the rest of us? Should we be altering our food choices to reduce our risks? And here's where I think the media did not do a great job of putting these findings into a larger context. And maybe that's because that wouldn't have been quite as clickworthy. Now, first, we need to understand the differences between hazards risks, and adverse outcomes. A hazard is simply the presence of an element that in the right conditions and circumstances could cause harm. A sharp knife, for example, is a cutting hazard. When we talk about risk, well, then we're starting to take into account the conditions and the circumstances in which this hazard exists so that we can estimate the chances that it might actually cause harm. A sharp knife balanced point up in the dish drain poses a much bigger risk than a sharp knife resting in a knife block inside of a closed drawer. But in both cases, the knife presents the same hazard. And finally, hazards and risks are not the same as adverse outcomes. An adverse outcome would be that I actually slice my finger on the knife sticking out of the dish drain. This outcome is not guaranteed to happen. I could walk by that dish drain without cutting my finger, but the position of the knife point up in the dish drain increases the likelihood or the risk of that adverse outcome actually occurring. And other unrelated factors could further increase the risk of that adverse outcome occurring. If the lights are out in the kitchen, for example, that might increase the chances that I cut myself on a knife that's sticking out of the dish drain so I could reduce my risk by turning on the lights before I enter the kitchen. But I'm not going to reduce them to zero. The knife still poses a hazard, and its position in the dish drain still presents an elevated risk. But remember, risk is just a statistical likelihood. It does not predict the future. All right, with that somewhat silly illustration of hazard 
risk, and outcomes in mind, let's go back to these two studies. So both of the studies started by detecting the presence of a hazard, a compound that could pose a health threat if you were exposed to sufficient amounts of it. They then went on to use different types of statistical modeling to try to calculate the actual risk involved for people who ate various amounts of the food in question. In both cases, risks for the most typical eating patterns were minimal. It was only those who might consume large amounts of a very small number of specific foods who could have a substantial risk. However, no adverse outcomes were observed. Because these studies weren't looking at outcomes, they were simply detecting hazards and calculating risks. I'm not aware of any studies showing adverse outcomes as a result of consuming produce that might have contained pesticide residues or fish that might have contained PFAs. Quite the opposite. Fruits, vegetables, and seafood are all foods that we would normally consider to be healthy choices. We would encourage you to eat these foods. And reports like this can have a chilling effect on people's willingness to eat these foods. For example, in a recent nationwide consumer survey conducted by the International Food Information Council, four out of 10 people said that they avoided eating certain fruits or vegetables due to fears of pesticide residues. Now, before we decide that produce or fish are just too risky for us to eat, I think we need to look at the potential risks of not eating them. In general, consumers who are worried about pesticide residues are afraid that exposure to these chemicals might increase their risk of cancer. However, not eating these fruits and vegetables might pose a greater cancer risk. Researchers writing in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute specifically looked at the impact of consuming produce on cancer risk, and they were assessing both the risks associated with pesticide exposure and the cancer-protective effects of eating more produce. And here's the bottom line. If you want to reduce your cancer risk, you want to eat more produce, even though that produce may contain pesticide residues. And similarly, while the risks of PFA exposure from high intake of shrimp and lobster might affect a tiny slice of the population, the benefits of seafood consumption are far more universal And they're also available at much lower levels of consumption. People eating just one to two servings of fish per week can cut their risk of heart disease, stroke, and all-cause mortality. Now, the safest level of PFAs or pesticides in the food supply would obviously be zero. And if there are steps that we can take, either individually or as a society, to reduce the amount of these chemicals in our food supply, that's definitely worth pursuing. And furthermore, I want to acknowledge that everyone's tolerance for risk is different, which means that people may come to different conclusions about how or whether they want to change their behavior based on a given risk assessment. Here's the point that I want to make. When you assess your risk of an adverse outcome due to exposure to a hazard, such as pesticide residues, just remember to balance that potential harm against the well-documented benefits that you get from those foods and the increased health risks that you incur if you decide to avoid them. If you have a comment on today's episode or a question you'd like me to answer, you can email me at nutrition at quickanddirtytips.com. I'd also like to invite you to check out my other podcast. It's called The Change Academy, where we explore the art and science of creating positive behavior change, both in our own lives and in our workplaces and communities. You can find it on all the major podcast platforms. Just search for Change Academy. Nutrition Diva is a quick and dirty tips podcast and supported by a fantastic team, which includes Brandon Getchis, Nathan Sems, Davina Tomlin, Holly Hutchings, Morgan Christensen, and Cameron Lacey. Thanks to all of them. And thanks to you for listening. I'll see you next week.